So I think I may have maybe stumbled on the origins of a very old trope in horror. That trope being the deep-seated rivalry between werewolves and vampires. And while this rivalry is not nearly as old as the legends themselves, I think it's a little older than the internet thinks it is. Salutations, fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and right around 20 years ago, I was introduced to the concept of the rivalry between werewolves and vampires in a very silly movie called Van Helsing. At the time, I thought this contrivance seemed kinda dumb, but I later learned that this rivalry sometimes turns up in fiction at large, but more often than not, the werewolf-vampire rivalry turns up in other silly movies. And the fact that the vampire versus werewolf feud is specifically a movie trope as opposed to being a fiction trope elsewhere is perhaps unsurprising, since super famous vampires like Dracula are at least as likely to turn into a werewolf as they are into a bat. Also, according to Rick Marshall over at Mental Floss, the first pairing of these immortal beasties in Mortal Kombat came to horror fans in the form of 1948's Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Before starting this project, the oldest werewolf legend I personally knew was that of Lycan, a smart aleck from ancient Greece who thought it was cute to serve human flesh as an offering to the gods. On learning of the deception, mighty Zeus cursed Lycan to crave human flesh, and the word lycanthropy was coined to describe the unfortunate plight of all werewolves thereafter. If this topic interests you, I would actually recommend the Mental Floss article because Mr. Marshall suggests that the first werewolf story dates all the way back to the epic of Gilgamesh. Anyway, in contrast to the werewolf, the origins of the vampire are a bit more nebulous. The Encyclopedia Britannica suggests that some of the first vampire stories sprung up in ancient Greece just like the werewolf, but both myths seem to have grown and matured separately, without a hell of a lot of crossover until the golden age of film, wherein Universal Pictures popularized a host of memorable monsters, then mixed and matched them into wildly popular mashup movies. But for reasons including but not limited to my limited attention span these days, this Halloween season, I have taken a shine to the short stories of Bram Stoker, which, in my opinion, beat the daylights of the Bram Stoker novels. They are succinct, evocative works, elegant in their simplicity and with way less racism than longer works such as Lair of the White Worm. And while perusing these short stories, I eventually stumbled upon Dracula's Guest, a brief work generally assumed to be an alternate first chapter to Dracula though I personally think that it is a better story when the unnamed narrator is not John Harker. The end is nicely unsettling, and if the narrator is John Harker, this story paints him as an irredeemable dumbass for proceeding to Dracula's castle after the happenings in this story. Dracula's guest begins with our narrator conducting himself as would a nightmare tourist in Germany. See, he's an Englishman, right? And he wants to go exploring regardless of the dozen or so warnings that the locals give him, and the fact that tonight is Valpurgis Night a real event that falls on April 30th, the night before Valpurgis Day, on which some Catholics celebrate a saint who was the sworn enemy of pests, rabies, whooping cough, and witchcraft. But on the eve of Valpurgis Night, people light bonfires to keep the spooks away. And according to Stoker's story, the dead come out of their graves on Valpurgis Night to make mischief among the living. A phenomenon the narrator definitely knows about and calls to mind later. But the guys warning him not to be out after dark have, like, funny accents or something, and it's too nice a day to be indoors, and what a what would the locals know that an Englishman doesn't anyway? So the narrator heads for a deserted town that has piqued his curiosity, and the weather takes a turn for the worse, first to snow, then to hail. He takes refuge in a crypt, where he's blustered about by the elements, scared to death by a dead gal who appears to be very awake, swoons to a dead faint, and wakes to a vicious wolf on his chest. The narrator plays dead, the wolf is pulled off of him by forces unknown, and in rides the mounted police to revive the wilted narrator and bring him back to civilization. The narrator asks them how on earth they knew to look for him, and they tell him they'd received written instructions to watch over him by one Count Dracula, and the narrator makes the following observation. There was something so strange in all of this, something so weird and impossible to imagine, that there grew on me a sense of my being in some way the sport of opposite forces the mere vague idea of which seemed, in a way, to paralyze me. I was certainly under some form of mysterious protection. From a distant country had come, in the very nick of time, a message that took me out of the danger of the snow sleep and the jaws of the wolf. Now, if you take this as a John Harker adventure excised from the Dracula novel, that's fine, and I think most Dracula experts would agree with you. But if you encounter Dracula's guest in isolation, like I did, it kind of reads like the wolf is a rival 
and like Dracula is taking the wolf's toy away just for spite. And I personally enjoy that reading. The idea that Dracula is a territorial villain who might save some headstrong dope for reasons of his own and leave him with a nagging puzzlement as to why. Am I in debt to this Dracula guy? How long has he been watching me? And what, oh, what could have possessed him to send a posse after a stranger knowing that I was going to be a dumbass and die as wolf's bait if he had not intervened? And through this lens of one who views the wolf as a rival to Dracula, this story, first published in 1914, strikes me as a plausible origin of the feud between vampire and werewolf that predates and is at least as valid as this one, by a respectable margin. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. If you found this video at all interesting, please consider giving this one a try. Meantime, take it easy. Love you. Bye.